Welcome back to Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. I'm Julie Grant. Your daily sidebar continues now as we focus on the opening statements in the Jinx murder trial. For as thorough as Deputy DA John Lewin's opening has been thus far, there have been a couple of really head-scratching moments. Take this one, for instance. The evidence will also show that Mr. Durst was very cognizant of certain personality quirks and how he could utilize them to his advantage. He discussed his burping and how he utilized that in situations to assume a certain level of control. And, and I remember uh, Jim saying to me at some point that, um, you know, you would burp in public. Oh, think yes, about it. yes, yes. Tell me about that. I would burp in public. I got used to it in college. Um, and I just kept burping in public. And when it, I mean, I'm amazed that, 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 that my father never said, Bob, but he couldn't say to me, you can't come in if you're going to keep coming into the room. It's terrible. It's embarrassing. And burping loudly, belching, he said. You don't burp, you belch. Or maybe that was my sister who first came up with that. He belches. Uh, and I kind of liked it in, in, in the business because it made it very clear to everybody that I wasn't going to follow the simplest of the rules. For, 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 forget about taking the thing seriously. And was it, um, I mean, did you enjoy the idea that you'd be in a meeting and would disrupt Yes, I did enjoy it. Tell me in a, in a full sentence. Well, I would be in a meeting and I would try, be trying to impress upon everybody and I thought it was a complete waste of time and silly and I would let out a big belch. No apology, no I'm sorry, no nothing. Just, you know, keep going. But you knew you were doing it. Yeah, sure. Oh, how gross. <laughs> oh, how disgusting. And why? Why? Why does this need to be in the open? I want to turn to Seema, Vinny, and Ted now. Okay. Uh, let's give it some context, though. This, this, that interview about the burping, so this is why, to me, it's confusing. That interview was done, I think it was December of 2010, over three days, that interview. And then the whole uh, mic drop moment when he's got the hot mic on was in 2012, and he says, oh, the burping, the burping. And when he says that killed them all, of course. So... My question is, do you guys think that maybe the burping is a distraction when he wants to get out of something? Um, because why I, did he mention the burping? I don't know. Other than to show that, like, this guy is also very bad-mannered and very impolite. I don't know the utility of that in the open. I mean, he has got so, more money than he knows what to yeah. do with, and he also yeah, just why doesn't care who he offends and... Yeah, I don't know why the filmmakers why are bringing the up the burping, yeah. but I mean, yeah. it's interesting to watch and it's mm -hmm. interesting to hear. It's a very quirky uh, thing, uh, but at the end of the day, it makes him very unlikable, mm -hmm. very, very unlikable, and that's part of what you have to do. Well, the burping as opposed to the murders? No, no, but that's <laughs> right. You're like the total that's picture. That's the least of your problems. The total picture. Well, who's more likely to commit a murder? Someone who's who's willing to talk about doing that? Sure. Obviously, he is. It's so gross. I know. Like, I couldn't help but it's, laugh it's like, while he was saying this. I mean, did it's you weird know, let us know? I. It's just, ew, ew. Ted, you were cracking Ted. up too. Yeah. Tell me your oh, yeah. Well, he is a weirdo. And um, <laughs> I agree with Vinny that you, you do get a sense that he's bragging about not being a rule follower. And, and he even says that I was doing that just to tell the people that in that meeting that I thought it was ridiculous and I wasn't going to, you know, I, I'm above that. So... Yeah. He's above the law. Oh, guess what? He's also the guy that murders people because he just doesn't care. And that was the point. Doesn't follow the norms of society. Right. right. He just doesn't. He even right. said that, the, you know, it was a curse. He was born with more money than he, he's always had more money than he could spend. And he was smart enough but dark enough to, instead of embracing it and jumping into the business, he just was just Mr. Naysayer, Mr. I'm not following the rules. Spoiled brat that grew up to an old spoiled brat. Exactly. Um, and, yeah, and that's what right. the prosecution's alleging. Yes. And we know that something else they brought up that was interesting, bit of a head scratcher. Uh, you remember the gangster, Bugsy Siegel, famous gangster. Well, they brought up the fact that Susan Berman's father was uh, involved in the underworld, so to speak. Let's take a look at a clip from that. 
Now, Susan's father, Davey, was known as Davey the Juber, and he was a notorious gangster, and he actually replaced Bugsy Siegel running the Flamingo after Bugsy Siegel was killed by New York mobsters in, uh, I think, approximately 1950. And so Susan grew up in Las Vegas, and she was kind of like the princess of Las Vegas. Liberace would play at her birthday party. She hung out at the casino, and she was very close to her father. Now, Davey Berman was also a founding member of Murder Incorporated, and this was a crime organization that was responsible for many contract murders in the 30s and 40s. So, Susan grew up with a father who was one thing to her, but a completely another thing in his daily life and activities. And the evidence is going to show that uh, she was drawn to Bob Durst for some of those same reasons. Now, Susan absolutely romanticized her relationship uh, with her father. Unfortunately, by the time Susan was 12 years old, uh, both her parents uh, were gone. Her, her father died uh, during a surgery, and her mother ended up um, institutionalized and dying when Susan was very young as well. So as a result of Susan's upbringing, Susan maintained a strict code of honor and was incredibly loyal to her friends. All right, turn to my colleagues. Now, why do we think this was brought in? Ted, you've got a good theory. Well, at first I thought it was just to get this thing out of the fact that her mom was the, uh, dad was in the mob, but he died when she was 12, so I don't, I think it was more the... The code of honor, right? Yeah, it's just the, I think it was just the code of honor. Yeah, Again, good, right. do we really need that in the opening of this, of right. the of the ex, or the, the I'm glad they put it in there, though. Yeah, it some, is some interesting. Great photos. It's interesting yeah, stuff. Yeah. Um, what episode was that in? That was in episode four <laughs> of the opening statement. What what was what's interesting though is is she's able to love her father even though he's a killer. And remember, she loved Robert Durst as a friend even though she knew that maybe he was a killer. I think that's part and of the no theme. And no fear. And no that's fear. Ex right? Excellent point. Yeah. There you go. For sure. And mm. knowing, see, we had the code of silence, yeah. keeping quiet. We, we know she kept quiet about what she knew is the state's theory of why she was, was killed. Uh, okay, something else that was brought up, another head scratcher, my personal favorite moment, when John Lennon's name was mentioned. Let's watch. In 1965, after Durst graduated from Lehigh, a small college in Pennsylvania, he came out to L.A. allegedly to attend graduate school at UCLA. In fact, he spent his time out here smoking marijuana, going to screen therapy with John Lennon, and dodging the draft. Those are his words, not mine. Dodging the draft, smoking marijuana, but that. scream therapy with John yeah, Lennon. That's good stuff. have to admit I didn't know what that was. had to look it up, but it is yeah. a form of psychotherapy. And... Uh, <laughs> Gotta love John Lennon. Does that give him a little more likability with this tree at all that he hung out with such a well, lovely Well, it's interesting. Guy. John Lennon, I mean, when, when we did the Phil Spector case, John Lennon played a huge role in that as well. There was a, Phil Spector pulled a gun out in the studio with John Lennon and the gun went off and there have been stories about that as well. So interesting that Lennon makes another appearance here in in an L.A. trial. Yeah. Right, right. Such a peaceful guy, known for just being so peaceful and so beloved. And then here's Robert, Robert Durst, who's certainly not known for... No, and Phil Spector as person. well. Yeah, yeah. And he's hanging out with right. these people, which is strange, right? Yeah. But I think it we just think goes so. to the prosecution uh, building upon he's a spoiled brat, he's entitled, he's got celebrity friends, he's hanging out with uh, John Lennon going to Studio 54 on different occasions. So also I went to Xenon, which, which I, I pointed out on my show last night, was the first nightclub I ever went to. Where is it? Oh, Belmont? Yeah. No, it was in, in New York City, Xenon. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and Xenon, Durst was there. They had pictures from 82. Oh. I was like, was I there? No, I wasn't there. <laughs> I was there the following year. That's the following right. Were you DJing? A year after he a was there? A year after Durst was there, I was at Xenon. It was the first nightclub. Seabank was there? performing. What? Really? You have talents. You DJ too. Yeah, I wasn't DJing there. No, okay. I was just, a, I was just a, you know, one of many on, on the dance awesome floor. Self. Oh, yeah. dance That's so floor. cool. Vinnie Palatine. Xenons. Yeah. 
You gotta get Ted like, Rollins wow. on the dance floor because Ted <laughs> Rollins can moonwalk. A little known fact. Look at that. Him, it's can awesome. you really? Yes. Yeah. Did it, Michael trust me, it's you awesome. That during the coverage of his trial? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, did uh, he know? Yeah, I wish, yeah. He knew you could moonwalk. Did Michael no. Jackson know? No, he didn't. Okay. You shame. look a lot younger than Durst. Uh, well, well yeah. so he was at the same club as you were in, like in Xenon, a, yeah. Xenon. Well, he was young, and yeah, Durst so Durst was, old. was an older. Durst was a little bit older, yeah. Yeah. but New York clubs are it like that. I was at Fifty Four sure. also. Really? Were really? you really? Yeah. Look at you. So at 54. cool. Yeah. Vinny Politan, you are so oh, cool. You we got to talk more yeah. about this in another sidebar. Call the Cabana. All right. Call yes. Cabana. Please get a shot of this. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's the goodbye no, show. No, that was break. Call the Cabana. Okay. Nah. Oh, see you, Vinny and Ted. You guys are the best. Thank you so much, and thank you for being with us at home. When we come back, how did a once very loving marriage turn abusive? and toxic. We'll talk about the turbulent relationship between Robert Durst and his wife Kathleen next.